But while you're in escrow is when you want to set up the exchange, right? Uh, not before and certainly not after. Yeah. Right? When es- once escrow closes and your exchange is not set up, you're you're dead in the water. And Got I it. get about one of those phone calls every month. I haven't even touched the money yet. It's still with escrow. The answer is no. Oh, wow. You have to set up the exchange before it closes. Hey, it's Ernest here with SG Associates, and today we are with Josh Messian with Ten Peak 1031 Exchange. So, Josh, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into 1031 exchanges. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, let's see. I went to law school in New York uh, way back in the day, and I ended up taking a real estate class my second year. Kind of fell in love with real estate law, and so that's what I ended up practicing okay. when I left law school. Uh, did that for like six years, got totally burnt out on the law firm lifestyle, billable hours, you know, 60 plus hour weeks, yeah. all of that. And so I decided to do a little bit of a career change and move back from New York to LA, which is where I grew up. Okay. And so when I got back here, I decided to look for something related to real estate because I knew real estate and just apply to a bunch of jobs and by chance just ended up getting an interview at 1031 exchange company peak 1031 where i am now nice. and my boss and i clicked and uh, you know he liked the fact that i had a legal background and it just kind of went from there and i've never looked back nice nice yeah. so i know you guys are located in woodland hills i mean do you what areas do you cover um locally nationwide yeah so i would say a lot of our client base of course is in southern california okay. because we're based in southern california but we've handled exchanges in literally all 50 states, except maybe for Alaska or something. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so we handle exchanges all over the country because it is a federal uh, tax provision. So, Got it. Nice, yeah. nice. So what exactly is a 1031 exchange for, I mean, for someone trying to utilize one? Sure. So uh, it's a means of deferring the capital gains taxes uh, when you sell investment real estate. And so okay. just to give you an example... Um, If I buy a piece of investment property for Mm $500,000 and then I sell it some years later for $700,000, I would pay capital gains taxes on that $200,000 profit. Correct. Right. Um, But if I take the money from the sale and I reinvest it into another investment property worth $700,000 or greater, then I can defer those capital gains taxes. Theoretically, I can defer them forever uh, until I die, at Mm -hmm. which point, you know, all the gain gets wiped out because there's a stepped up basis. The big catch in all of that is that a third party has to hold the money between when I sell and when I buy the next property. Okay. And that's what we do. That's the really simple version of what we do. It gets a little bit more complicated. There's obviously a lot of like real estate and tax law stuff that comes into play, but that's the simple version. Got it. So basically you guys are holding that money because if the investor touches that money, they will automatically be taxed on that. That Is that correct? correct. Yeah, that's the big no-no in 1031 exchanges is that the client cannot have actual or constructive receipt of the funds. And constructive receipt just refers to control over the funds. Got it. So for example, if the funds were in a bank account that the client controls, even though they've never technically touched the money, that's still considered receipt and therefore would invalidate. And that would cause a taxable event. That's correct. Got it, got it. Okay, so um, explain to me the different varieties of 1031 exchanges and what is the most common used? Yeah, so certainly the most common exchange is called a delayed exchange. It's the exchange that, I mean, pretty much whenever anyone talks about 1031 exchanges, that's what they're talking about. Uh-huh. And this is where a um, person sells their investment property. They have 45 days to ident- from the time that they close on the sale of that investment property. Okay. They have 45 days to identify their replacement property or properties. And then they have 180 days to actually close on all their replacement properties. I see. So there's a six month window in a delayed exchange where you have to sell and then buy whatever you're going to buy. Okay. Um, The other types, some people might have heard of a reverse exchange. A reverse exchange comes into play when it's a situation where you have to acquire the replacement property, Mm -hmm. close on it before you can sell your relinquished property. So for example, you know, you know, you want to sell a property, you know, Uh you want to do an exchange, but you don't want that 45 day gun to your head. Got it. So you go out and you start looking for properties. You come upon a great replacement property and you go under contract, you lock it in. The only problem is that 
the seller wants a really quick escrow and you're not going to have time to sell your relinquished property before you have to actually buy the new property, the replacement uh, property. Yeah. So you set up a reverse exchange and they don't always work by the way. Sometimes you're not able to do one and I won't go too far down that rabbit hole, but essentially it allows you to close on the purchase before you sell the other property. Ah, okay. Okay. So that's another tool. And then what's the next? The last one is called an improvement exchange. Uh, An improvement exchange is kind of cool because it allows someone to um, add the value of improvements that they make to their replacement property um, for exchange purposes. So let me just give you a quick example. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I sell a property for a million dollars, I need to buy a replacement property worth a million dollars. Correct. But let's say instead uh, I find a property that's worth $800,000 and it's a fixer upper that I really like. Okay. I can go and buy that property, set up an improvement exchange, buy the property for 800. Okay. And then during the six month exchange window, I can make hopefully the $200,000 of improvements to that property. And then at the end, get credit for the full million dollar value, right? The 800 uh, I see. plus the 200 of improvements that were made. So you're basically basing it off of the future value after improvements. Uh, Not even future value because um, the future value is probably going to be higher. It's actually the cost of the improvements. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So So just the cost of what you're going to, what you plan on putting into the home, into the proper, into the property. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Nice. Nice. So you basically, it allows you to use tax deferred money to fund those improvements. Nice. Okay. I I had never heard about that one. So that's definitely a great one. It's a good one. So are there any specific requirements and rules for someone who wants to utilize a 1031 exchange? Yeah, there are. So um, I would say that the three, what I like to call the three pillars of a successful 1031 exchange, excuse me, number one, both properties have to be held for investment or business purposes, right? So the big no-no here is people will sometimes ask me, hey, I'm going to sell my primary residence I'm going to have some capital gains beyond the section 121, you know, exclusion uh-huh. where if you're selling your, your primary residence, you get to exclude up to 250 K of gain or 500 if you're married and filing jointly. Yeah. Uh, Hey, I'm selling my primary residence. I'm going to have more than that in gain. Can I do a 1031 exchange? The answer is no. Okay. Right. Although I will say that there is a potential situation. It's like a hybrid situation. For example, like let's say you're selling a property that's a duplex mm-hmm. where you live in one and rent out the other. Okay. You have a mixed use property. That's, okay, right? You would basically bifurcate it, split it up. Uh, you take the section 121 exclusion on the half that's the primary residence. Okay. And then you would 1031 exchange the other half. I see. Right. Or oh. another example might be a house with an ADU. And let's just say the ADU is 25% of the property, right? Uh-huh. You would take that 25% of the value that you're selling, and then you would use that for your 1031 exchange. So who, I guess, comes up with the percentage of like of that like is it okay cpa will will say based on how you file taxes and 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 file that exactly okay it's definitely something that the client should consult their cpa with got it for um so and then the second pillar so there's both investment property right Mm -hmm. second pillar uh equal or greater value and equal or greater equity so the replacement property that's purchased in the exchange has to be a equal or greater value so if i sell for a million and uh, I had fifty thousand dollars in closing costs. I need to buy a new property worth nine fifty or greater. Got it. Okay. So, equal or greater value, you, you're allowed to deduct the closing costs. From, okay. From that calculation. Okay. Um, and then the second part of it, equal or greater equity, is basically whatever my net proceeds are that come out of that sale. You know, whether it's you know nine fifty all cash because there is no debt on the property, mm-hmm. or maybe it's six hundred because I paid off a. A three hundred fifty thousand dollar loan, right? I have to use all of that cash down on the next property or properties. I can't have any money left over. So all those gains have to be utilized to the next property. All of the net proceeds have to be rolled into the next property. Okay, right. and then anything left, Uncle Sam comes and anything says, "Where's left my money?" <laughs> gets taxed as long term capital gains. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And then the third pillar we already kind of talked about. Uh, The client has 45 days from the time that they close on the sale of their relinquished property, 45 days to identify their replacement property, Mm -hmm. and 180 days to actually close on it or multiple properties, whatever it is. Got it. And when you say multiple properties, that just as long as the sum equals equals that amount? That is exactly right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So let's just say, um, you know, my my goal is to buy a million. I sell for a million, right? I need to buy... 
technically it'd probably be like 950, but let's just call it a million dollars of replacement property. I can either go buy, you know, one property for a million. Mm -hmm. I can buy two properties for 500, three properties for 333K. Okay. Whatever okay. it is. Yeah. And is it just real estate or are people able to put them in alternative funds or is there anything else that you guys like um, anything else that you offer besides real estate or is it just what, what other options do they have? Good question. So section 1031 as of 2018 is limited solely to real property. Okay. So it has to be investment, real property to investment, real property. Um, the closest thing that I can think of that's kind of like almost like a security is something called a Delaware statutory trust. Okay. Um, it's they're similar to a, a REIT if you've heard of a REIT. Yeah. Right. Where it's essentially it's a real estate investment vehicle that you're buying into. You're buying a very small percentage of something that owns, you know, like a 50 or $100 million portfolio of assets. Okay. So you know, those are becoming more and more popular, especially in this market where it's harder and harder to get into a property. Yeah. DSTs are, you know, there's sort of a, a lower threshold for getting into those as far as difficulty. Yeah, no, recently I had a client who sold their property in Arizona. They were doing a 1031. Yeah. We could not find anything. Yeah. So then I guess their window was getting tight and then they decided to put their money into a REIT. Really common scenario. Especially I think in, in the market that we're yeah. in right now. Really common scenario. And that's why I'll still bring it up. Like when I'm talking to agents and stuff like that, like mm -hmm. obviously as an agent, right? Your hope is that yeah. you're going to help them sell the relinquished property and then also find the next property Correct. for them. Right. But still it's good for agents to know because that's that backup that you can sell to the client and say, okay, look, I'm going to help you find your replacement property. But even if somehow I don't do that, you always have the, the ability to go into a DST. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So, so Josh, what are, what does the typical 1031 process look yeah. like? Good question. So a lot of people ask me, when do I start my exchange? The answer mm -hmm. is once you are under contract on the sale of your relinquished property. Okay. Okay. So I'm happy to talk to people before they ever sell, before they ever go under contract. But while you're in escrow is when you want to set up the exchange, right? Uh, not before and certainly not after. Yeah. Right? Once, once escrow closes and your exchange is not set up, you're, you're dead in the water. And Got I it. get about one of those phone calls every month. Oh, man. Someone that already closed. <laughs> hey, I just closed yesterday. Oof. You know, I, I'm seeing like the withholding on my closing statement that has to go to the California Franchise Tax Board for my capital gains taxes. Can I please do a 1031 exchange? I haven't even touched the money yet. It's still with escrow. The answer is no. Oh, wow. You have to set up the exchange before it closes. So, And that's something set up by Peak Exchange or is it with an in, in, in you guys work with escrow to do that? Correct. Yeah, we work with escrow. So essentially the process, sorry, going really back to your original question, right? <laughs> The actual process is once escrow opens, connect us with escrow. Okay. Right? We'll request a copy of the contract, the title report, escrow instructions if they prepare them. And then we use the information in those to draft our exchange documents. Got it. Essentially legal docs. Uh, we send those out to escrow and to the client via email, but we'll also usually send them via DocuSign to make it easy. Mm -hmm. Once the client executes those, the exchange is set up. Okay. okay. And then from there, it's just like a regular escrow, right? Escrow moves forward. It closes. Uh, and then when escrow closes, the net proceeds come over to us, peak 1031. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the client will get a receipt. This is how much we're holding. You know, this is your 45-day deadline. This is your 180-day exchange it. deadline. You know, and then um, once the client finds a replacement property, they let us know. Again, connect us with escrow. Mm -hmm. If we're already holding their funds, we can wire the earnest money deposit on their behalf. Okay. And then when it comes time to close, we wire the closing funds. Got it. And that's it. Nice, nice. So... Sure, it happens, but like you said, what so what happens if a replacement property, I think we kind of touched on this. I mean, what happens if a replacement property is not identified or closed within the exchange time frame? Yeah, so there's a few different permutations of how that can all play out. So, I mean, the really short answer is that, you know, eventually they'll get their money back and they'll pay taxes on it. That's Got it. the short answer. Uh-huh. Um, you know, if, if a client is, if they just don't identify anything within the 45 days, um, or they identify something, but then as they approach the 45th day, they know it's not going to go through and, and they want to revoke their identification, they can revoke it. Okay. And in that scenario, they can just get their money back on day 46. Okay. Cause that's when their exchange has failed. That's fine. Right. Um, the worst scenario, and this is why I'm 
going down this little rabbit yeah. hole for a minute is imagine a situation where they uh, identify a property mm -hmm. and now we're past the 45 days. Okay. And, and then on day 50, they come back to me, their accommodator and say, you know what, that property we identified, that deal fell through. Someone else bought the place. Uh, it burned down. Like, yeah. whatever. <laughs> There's no way we could ever possibly close on that property. So we have a debt. We have a failed exchange. Can you please just send me my money back so I can pay my taxes? And the answer is yes, of course. But now that money is stuck for the entire 180 day exchange period. Oh, yes. So they cannot do anything until yeah. that 180 is completed. And their exchange fails because they're because the only way they can get their money back is by completing their exchange. OK. Right. And there's just money left over or failing their exchange. Right. Well, they can't fail it for not identifying. Right. Because we're already pa they identified and we're past the 45 now. Mm -hmm. So now the only way to fail their exchange and get their money back is to wait out that 180 day period. Oh, wow. Which means that they get this double whammy. Right. Of not only are they going to pay the taxes, but now their money is tied up yeah. for essentially six months, you know, and they can't do anything with so it. So even if they were to identify another property that it wouldn't work. So if they're within the 45 day window, they can amend that identification as much as they wish. Can but you once they're past the 45, they cannot. Can you identify multiple properties? Yeah. Good question. So um, mo there are three rules of identification. 90% of people identify under what's called the three property rule, which just says you can identify up to three properties okay. regardless of their value. So if I have a million dollar exchange value, I could identify again, kind of like what I said before, three properties worth 1 million, you know, uh, and then close on just one of those properties. I could identify three properties worth 500 and then I just have to close on two of the three. Okay. Or I can identify three properties worth 333, in which case I'd have to actually buy all three. I see. Right? So someone couldn't technically come in and identify three one million dollar properties and just close on one. Uh, no, no, they can. They can. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so th that was like the first example I gave. Yeah. So they can identify three one million dollar properties, and as long as they close on one of those three, they're fine. I see. Okay. Um, so the three property rule limits you on the number of properties you can identify, but you're not limited on the dollar value. Got it. The next rule, which is the second most common, is called the 200% rule. And that basically says it's kind of like the inverse of the three property rule. So there you're not limited on the number of properties. So I can identify four properties, five properties, 10 properties, 20 properties if mm -hmm. I wish. But now I'm capped on the dollar value that I can identify. So, and it's 200% or twice what I sold for. Ah, uh, okay. So in that example, okay. right, if I have a million dollar exchange, I can identify up to $2 million worth of replacement property under the 200% rule. Got it. Okay. And Got then it. the last one real quick, I'll just mention it. No one ever uses it. I've seen it used like once ever. It's the 95% rule. I like to joke that it should be called the 100% rule. Basically, you can identify as many properties as you wish, as much dollar value as you wish, but the big but is that you have to actually acquire 95% of the value that you identify, which in most situations means you have to buy everything you identify. Oh, wow. So okay. It works in rare, rare circumstances, but usually yeah, if one, if the first two don't work, that third one isn't going to work for a lot of people either. So. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. So Josh, tell me some of the common misconceptions that people have about a 1031 exchange. Yeah. So I think one common misconception is the definition of like kind property. So a lot of people will ask, okay, so I'm selling um, a single family home for my mm -hmm. exchange. Does that mean I need to buy a new single family home? I know these are called like kind exchanges. Um, and the answer is no. The definition of like kind is actually quite broad. Okay. It just means any, any investment or business property. So any property that's held for investment purposes, which is like renting it out or business purposes, which is like, you know, it's like your office that you have your bit, you're running your business out of and you're not living there is kind of the key. I see. Okay. So a business qualifies as long as you're not living there. Cause yeah. and so if, if you are, obviously you, you know, you would allocate it. Right. So kind of like what you do on your taxes, if you have a home office, mm -hmm. right. If, if 25% of the building is used for business, then you'd allocate that. Got it. Got it. Okay. Portion. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so um, the next one, I, I'm looking down here at my list because this one I actually had to make a list for. Um, so the next thing is, uh, one misconception is 
do I have to be under contract on my replacement property in order for it to, to be identified? Okay. The answer is no. Um, I like to give the example. I could be driving down the street past a house or a, a building that I like. Mm -hmm. It's not for sale. It's not on the MLS. And I can say, you know what? I like that property. I'm going to identify it for my exchange. <laughs> okay. And I can write it on the <laughs> list, sign it, date it, send it into my 1031 company and it's identified. Right. Um, so you don't have to be under contract. You don't have to have made an offer. You're just, adding it to a list. Got it. Um, the next one here that I put down was that, um, oh, this is a good common misconception. So some people think that they only need to reinvest their net proceeds. So I'll give you an example. Okay. Uh, again, sell for a million dollars. Let's just say they pay off a $300,000 mortgage. And so their equity is $700,000. That's yeah. obviously before closing costs. Mm -hmm. But let's just kind of put those aside. For easy numbers. For easy numbers, right? So they have $700,000 in cash there, right? A lot of people think, well, all I have to do is just spend that $700,000, right? And, and I'll have a fully tax deferred exchange. That's actually not true. They actually need to go buy a new property for a million dollars, less their closing costs, Got which it. means that there's going to be a gap, right? On that new property between what they have to buy and the amount of money that they have to buy it with. And that gap has to be closed either with by getting a new loan or coming in with outside cash. Ah, uh, okay. So I think most people would think, like you said, 700 takes care of it, but no, they would have to go qualify for an, for another loan for 300 or whatever above that 1 million yep. and or come up with the other cash. It's exactly Got right. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I put here on my little list is, um, okay, so people think that they can draw on their exchange funds whenever they wish. So I'll give you an example. Person sells their relinquished property, money mm -hmm. comes over to peak 1031. And then, you know, two weeks into the exchange, they call me up and this, I've gotten <laughs> dozens of these phone calls over the years. They call me up and say, hey, you know what? I, I need to pull out $20,000, you know, because I, I, don't, I need it for whatever, to pay off a high interest credit card or whatever it is. Uh -huh. You know, here's my wire instructions. Can you wire this to me tomorrow, please? And I have to say the answer is no, right? Because they are not allowed According to the Treasury regulations, these are called the G6 restrictions, if you ever want to Google it. Mm -hmm. They are not allowed to touch those funds while the exchange is ongoing. So there's two sort of semi-solutions to this, right? Um, number one is if they know going into the exchange that they want a portion of that money mm -hmm. and they're fine with paying taxes on it, they can just instruct their escrow officer on the sale of their relinquished property, you know, hey, I'm netting a million dollars Right. I want you I I want you to send fifty to me and then send the other nine fifty over to my accommodator. Got it. That's fine. Right. Escrow will send them the fifty K, they'll pay taxes on it and they can use it for whatever they wish at that point. Got it. So then right? escrow will do the withholdings that they need to do exactly. with that. Okay. Escrow would do the withholdings on the fifty K and then the rest would come over to us. Exactly. Got it. So um, that's if you know going into it, that's the best way to do it. If you know exactly like how much you're gonna spend or how much you need do that. Okay. The other option is what I would call like the wait and see approach, which is you have all the money. Let's just say the whole million dollars come over to us. Mm -hmm. You buy whatever you're going to buy. And then at the end, whatever's left over, it is what it is. And that'll go back to you. And again, you'll pay the taxes on it, et cetera. Um, you know, that, that approach kind of gives you a little bit more flexibility okay. in terms of like what you're going to buy. Cause you might not know how much you want to spend or what's out there. So, okay. Nice. Nice. But the key takeaway, you cannot touch your exchange funds. Once the they hit the exchange. exchange. That's the key takeaway. Okay. Yeah. So Josh, I mean, how can people find out more about you, more about Peak 1031? Um, yeah. I mean, so first of all, our website is just peakexchange.com. It's okay. peak like a mountaintop. So it's P-E-A-K, mm -hmm. uh, peakexchange.com. Um, I'm on there. You know, if you go to like the About Us section or something, I'm on there. There's okay. a link to all my contact information. You know, I mean, if you're wondering, my phone number, our phone number, 866-357-1031. Okay. Um, we're based in Woodland Hills, California, like you said, but we handle exchanges literally all over the country. Awesome. And then did you want to, do you have an Instagram or anywhere people can find you and follow you? So our Instagram page is peak 1031 exchange. So P-E-A-K 1031 exchange on Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, Josh, I appreciate you joining us today and, and giving us some, some great tips and knowledge about 1031 exchanges. Yeah. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm Ernest with SQ Associates and we'll see you next time.
Thanks, everyone.